Greetings, everyone. We are live here uh, right after that incredible session. Want to uh, thank everyone who's been waiting. I think uh, we got some friends from uh, Wisconsin, from New York. Uh, it's so good to see you all. Uh, we're a little bit early. Uh, praise the Lord. We we ended early, um, but. Uh, we want to introduce uh, one of my special guests. Uh, if you want to maybe say your name and and uh, what's your ministry responsibility and, and where's home for you? Uh, my name is Paula Fuller. I'm the executive vice president of People and Culture in InterVarsity. And my home is in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I also divide my time uh, in Madison, Wisconsin, where my office is, and Trinidad, which is where my husband is from and where we spend quite a bit of time. Well, we're still waiting on one more uh, guest, but we just thought since folks were waiting, we might as well just get started. And so uh, thank you for all of you who said hello. If others, you know, please say hello. And part of, I think, what we wanted to start off with is just reflecting on what an incredible session we just had. And I would love to hear from you all. Uh, what were some moments that really resonated with you, um, some places that you felt God was speaking to you? So uh, I thought that Paul and I could just start and kind of sharing, like, what were some moments? Uh, and I think for me, I was like, I was trying to think through and I was like every moment felt like my new highlight moment and it's like wow we we've been through a lot today from like you know the worship uh, to patience's incredible testimony to uh, I'm like there's so many things that we could talk about but I, I don't know Paul is there one moment for you where that, that that one or series of moments that stuck out to you well it was like this crescendo building it's like each moment built on the next I love the the talk uh, as Danielle was sharing the plenary speaker about when we see Jesus for who he is, it changes how we look at the world, how we look at other people, we see ourselves more clearly, but it changes how we live. And that sense of glory, of holy, it's like as we were worshiping, I just felt like we were all caught up into the throne room of God. And it was just this very sweet sense of the Lord's presence. And I was weeping. It was so wonderful. It's like, I didn't want it to end. So the worship definitely was the high point, but just the, the voices and testimonies blending together. The worship leader from Compa, from Mexico, the song that she uh, sang, the one that was written during the time of persecution and opposition in Chile, was so impactful. Was, yeah, that was definitely yeah. one of the highlights. Well, and you know, uh, that song, the name was Esperanza. If you go on our YouTube channel, you could find uh, Melissa teaching a brief tutorial of that song along with Eric. Um, so if you were trying to catch that song, you might want to check that one out. And and both of those songs are just were incredible. And I, I think I, I really appreciated um, the moments of really just celebratory, big, joyful fanfare of like, that is how we should worship God with the drums. And then there were the moments of just quiet where you could just hear 10,000 voices. Um, so that was, those are so great. And actually we have our, uh, our second uh, guest joining us. Um, Nigel, if you want to have a seat here, uh, that would be lovely. Thank, 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 thanks for joining us. Good to Hi. see you again, brother. Hi, Nigel. Oh, nice to see you. Yeah, Hi. so we're, we're just having a fireside chat with, you know, maybe... Where's the, where's the fire? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> a side Burning chat. Burning in our yeah, hearts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we're just kind of reflecting on, on, on this last session. And so we have uh, quite, quite a decent amount of people who are waiting. Uh, to, so we just started a little early. And uh, we've been asking them to share some highlights uh, from that as they were watching the live stream, what were some highlights and ways that God was speaking to them. And we just kind of shared a few ways that God was ministering to us. So I wonder, Nigel, if you could share um, what your ministry role is, where's home for you, and then was there a, a moment or a series of moments that really resonated with you tonight? Yeah, well, I'm Nigel Pollock. I'm on the leadership team of InterVarsity in Canada. And home is quite a complex Thing for me. I was born in Scotland, I've spent the last 13 years in New Zealand, and I've been in Canada since the start of September. So most of that time has been in student ministry within the IFES family, and uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. I think one of the things that resonated with me tonight is just the reminder of the, the holiness of, of God. Sometimes in evangelism, we can try to orientate students around the need that their friends face. But I think really, um, to be motivated to share the good news, what we need more than anything is a fresh encounter with the holiness of God. And you, you see that in the scriptures, you know, with Isaiah in the temple, 
and the, the year that King Uzziah dies, mm -hmm. and the, the temple is filled with these creatures. And Uzziah says to me, Woe to me, for I am a man of unclean lips, from a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the Lord. And the, one of the creatures brings a, a coal from the altar, and a coal should destroy him. But when it touches his lips, because it comes from the altar, instead of killing him, it purifies him. So when God says, who will go for us and who will I send? Isaiah says, here am I, send, send me. Or when Simon Peter, after the miraculous catch of fish, says, get away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. And Jesus doesn't deny that. He's encountered something of the otherness, the holiness of God. But Jesus says, come with me and I'll make you a fisher of men. So I think that the thing that resonated most tonight was just the, the reminder of the importance of us all to have a fresh encounter with the holiness of God and how that leads us into the wholeness of, of God. So that instead of domesticating the gospel and trying to make God you know, someone that we can control, that we come under uh, an increased sense of the Lordship of Christ in our own lives. And that transforms the way we think about ourselves and the people around us. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, yeah, I think, and I, I really appreciated how Danielle took Revelation 4, this passage that I've I've read, I've sung, and, and you know, Revelation song is one of my favorite worship songs, but I, I don't know if I never, if I ever saw it in such this evangelistic missional lens, and that really kind of helped me to think through the issue, the idea of holiness and the attribute of God. So I, I'm, I, I wonder, like, when you think of how to connect this idea of worship and seeing God on the throne and mission, like, what, what does that look like for you? How has that looked like in your own journey of discipleship, of seeing God and then being sent out into mission and leadership? So maybe Paul, you start with you. I think part of what I loved about her talk was she brought us into this sense of the awesomeness of God, but then challenged us to go out and be the amazing people so that other people could see God in us and that we would be able to see God in other people. And when I think about my own journey, um, when I encountered Kingdom First Christians who were passionate and alive with the love of God, there was something about their life that inspired me, that made me thirsty for what they had. And so I think that is very much tied to mission as we're living a kingdom life or looking through a kingdom lens that people desire what we have and we're able to invite them into relationship with God and to demonstrate that God's love is for everyone and um, that what he offers is available. It's not a, a distinctive thing that is tied to a unique person, but we can each express God's love in a unique and distinct way. I was, I was doing a, a seminar this afternoon on sport as, as mission. And one of the stories that I was telling was at the end of the, the season with one of the representative teams that I coached, one of the dads took me aside when they were leaving and said, some of the parents have been talking about you because we've been trying to, to work out your coaching. Because it seems to us that you're concerned to help our, our sons become better young men as well as better players. So I've been, I've been trying to get to the bottom of this. I've been Googling you. And there's, <laughs> there's quite a lot about you online. And I said, sure, some of them might even be true. <laughs> and he said, now don't, don't get me wrong, because I don't want to offend you, but it seems to me there might be some connection between your Christian faith and the way that you coach. Sorry if that's, if that's so terrible. I said, not terrible at all. I said, that's, uh, I'd be delighted if people thought there was a connection between my Christian faith and the way that I did anything. So he said, so you're not, um, you're not offended? And I said, not at all, I'm really encouraged. Thanks very much for sharing that. And he gave me a bottle of whiskey and wandered off down the, <laughs> down the, uh, down the driveway. Um, but the, the thing with, with those kinds of, of, of stories is that the thing that I've learned through um, years of coaching is that people need to see a lot of me if they're going to see a little bit of Jesus. And that's because I'm not a particularly good reflection of Jesus and it's because people start quite a long way back and sometimes in our evangelism we want people to see a lot of Jesus based on seeing a little of us so that we we, we treat people as projects and our evangelism as an activity rather than an intrinsic part of our, our life 
And I think part of the problem is that we compartmentalise worship into something that we do at certain times in the week in certain contexts rather than understanding. It's the, it's the whole of our life poured out to, to the living God in, in all that we do, whether it's in the classroom or the sports field or in the uh, online or in the relationships with our family and our friends and in our community, that the way that we do things can please and honour and praise God. And if we, if we live our lives as worship, and you know, singing God's praises is, is part of that, then um, other people will, will see something of God manifest in us and in our relationships and in the community of, of faith, which has a, a powerful um, impact. You know, Jesus prays that the, the world will, will see our, our unity and will know that it's a, it's a demonstration of the reality of the, of the gospel. And we're really united when we encounter, as you were just saying, that living God together and uh, and are able to, to praise him in all that we do and all that we all that we are yeah yeah well we want to just you know welcome all of you all who have joined in the last few minutes uh, we're here at the 25th urbana student missions conference in st louis missouri in the united states and we particularly want to extend a welcome to our international viewers we know there are a few of who's joining us from jakarta uh, we we heard from some from south africa and ecuador so for those of you particularly, it's, it's, it's morning time, we want to thank you, or even late at night, uh, thank you for staying up with us. Um, I'm here with Nigel Pollock, who's the president of InterVarsity Canada, and Paula Fuller, who's the executive vice president of InterVarsity USA. And we've been talking about this evening session, and one of the things that I was really struck by in Daniel's uh, sermon this, morning, this evening was how she really dramatically and with great humor talked about her kind of transformation from this immature place of kind of holding on to these stereotypes and how seeing Jesus allowed her to see people differently and what it meant to actually encounter you like you were saying like something changed as she saw Jesus and saw people differently and one of the questions our viewers asked was like how do you engage with friends or colleagues or coworkers who may have a hostility towards Christian faith or Jesus or religion and and how has encountering Jesus changed the way that you and them or interact with certain communities and, and shifted your perspectives. <laughs> yeah, it's very easy to make judgments on people based on the on the outside and the things that can easily divide us, the things that can tempt us to, to categorize people and label them and put them into, into boxes and to forget that everyone is a unique person made in the, in the image of God. And I think um, one, of, one of the things that I've done sometimes in student mission is I've encouraged people to, to think of the person that they think is the least likely person who will ever become a Christian. You know, the person that they know who is, is just completely hostile and against and will, would never be interested and to start to pray for that person intentionally over time with friends to pray that this person would respond to the to the gospel and it's been astonishing over the years how often somebody has come up to me in a university context and said that that, that person that that person who was never going to be interested they're here tonight because God loves people and God doesn't see people as, as we see people. And trying to, you know, I think one of the, the great things that Danielle was talking about was about um, that encouragement to see people through the lens of the gospel rather than through the lens of our personality or our culture. Because there will always be people that we find more difficult or more challenging or, or harder to, to, to understand. Um, but each person is known by God and loved by God and God is working out their purposes for everyone in the, in the world. And the challenge for us really is to be in the right place at the right time with the right heart, with the right words for the right people so that God in his great grace and mercy can aggregate our little contribution and help people to, to see him more clearly for themselves. I was thinking when it comes to the sense of 
you know, feeling hostility for particular groups of people or even the hostility or challenge in our own hearts, sometimes so much of that is based on perception or judging someone from afar as opposed to experiencing them up close. And I don't know if you've ever had um, a situation where because of uh, a set of circumstances beyond your control, you either find yourself in close proximity or having to interact with someone who feels difficult or challenging. Sometimes it could be people in your own family who are difficult and challenging. Mm -hmm. And in the course of that interaction, um, either that perception is broken or when you see yourself uh, as needing God or reminded how God has worked on you, it gives you grace or patience or an ability to see God in someone else in a way that's outside of your uh, perception, like you have a certain perception and you realize it's wrong after yeah. you've spent time with that person or they shake up your stereotype and they show themselves be some, there's something about them you didn't know that changes completely how you think about them. Mm -hmm. So I think God has a way of breaking down our perceptions, uh, our barriers that prevent us from seeing people the way they are, experiencing parts of them that are quite beautiful and often my uh, stereotypes or the negative things are dismantled in the context of relationship. Yeah, I think it's also it's also worth saying that we can sometimes be the people that are difficult. That other, <laughs> that other <Sometimes>. people um, <laughs> have a have a stereotypical view. Of. I know that's hard to believe, sports fans, but you know we we um you know and, and we relate to people because we are accepted and we are forgiven with all the, the faults that we have. You know, who could stand if sins were known yeah. applies to us about ourselves as much yeah. as as much as as other people. Yeah. Um, and I think that, that you know to us who have received grace, who have received yeah. that unconditional love of the gospel, extending that same grace to the people around us is partly a response to being forgiven people. You know, that those of us who have known grace should show grace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that a question, uh, the viewer raised this question, which I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, is he asked, uh, should we see the world as Christians with rose-colored glasses, as Daniel brought up? And, or or she she distinguished between rose-colored glasses and kingdom glasses. And I, I just feel like it's so easy to go from one extreme of rose-colored glasses to a total, whatever the opposite of rose is, where really you see just so much things that are broken and messed up and, and we're here at a missions conference and Daniel just challenged us to see the world with the kingdom lens and so I was wondering from your experience what does a kingdom lens of the world look like and, and, and how has it been for you to kind of develop that kingdom lens in your own ministry? <laughs> um, I think one of the things I've appreciated about Revelations and even the session tonight is the opportunity to be refreshed and reminded. Um, the vision of Jesus in Revelation as the slain lamb, but also the one who conquers and is the only one worthy of power and glory. You're reminded of Jesus' triumph over sin, over the grave, his resurrection power. And I think that is part of the kingdom lens, that as you're looking through and looking at the brokenness or the challenges, the pain in the world, you realize that God is able to redeem uh, all of that brokenness. He's able to reconcile the world to himself. And so there's almost this cosmic sense of Christ and the power of God that can take what is irreparably broken or damaged and can bring restoration and hope. And part of that I saw through that song that was saying at a time of great, um, uh, persecution, but there's a, a sense of hope in the song. You can sing about the future, you can sing about tomorrow. You have hope because your future is Jesus. And I think that's part of the kingdom lens that can allow you to not escape the pain or the horror or the trauma of life, but to recognize that even in the midst of that, there is a God who is over and above it, and that ultimately he can give us victory in the midst of those things and over those things. Yeah, I think that's great. I think that the exile for me is a powerful paradigm of, of living in the world where we don't belong. So you know, in, the, in the Old Testament, the people of Israel are taken into captivity in Babylon. And there are prophets who are prophesying that they'll be home for Christmas, you know, figuratively speaking. But it's all going to be okay and they'll be going, they'll be going back. And Jeremiah writes to the people in, in exile. 
and he says to them to, to get involved in Babylonian society, that they're to plant, they're to, um, to, to give their sons and daughters in, in marriage, they're to build houses, um, they're to seek the welfare of the city, you know, to seek the welfare of pa Babylon, this great enemy who has taken them away and sacked the, sacked the temple and seemed to have destroyed God's purposes. But he says, but remember that in 70 years, God is going to take you home. That you are to live in Babylon and to seek the welfare of Babylon, but you're not to become Babylonian because you are mine. And part of being mine is that you live with a future hope of what I have promised I will do. And we know that God keeps his, keeps his promise. So I think part of the challenge for us today is to be engaged but not to be engaged imagining this world is all there is, which I think is, is partly the, the real benefit of looking at Revelation in these days, is that it reminds us of the future hope of what God is going to do, and that we have a destiny that, that isn't bound up with this world, but needs to shape the way that we behave in the world very, um, very profoundly. And he then goes on to use a, a verse that is, is a well-known verse in the Old Testament, um, which says, I alone know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to fail you, plans to give you a future and a hope. And one of the tragedies is we use that verse to console someone who's broken up with their boyfriend or who's failed an exam, but it's actually a far higher, far better, far more glorious hope that is being articulated for the whole people of God. That, you know, we will, God knows the plans that he has for us. He knows that there is a future for us. And we are to live in the light of that future, which has been revealed to us. And that is part of our identity as the people of God. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And, you know, one of the other questions that we got from Carolyn Lancaster, who asked us. Um, Hi, Carolyn. <laughs> uh, what does it look like as leaders who's been on this journey for some time um, to have fresh encounters with God in ways that so that they don't start to lose that perspective and kind of like tonight we had a fresh encounter with God I believe all of us here and those of you watching at home we got to see God on the throne and and as people are sent out in mission over the long haul uh, how, do, how do you keep that so I'm wondering how have you as leaders and disciples uh, cultivated fresh encounters with God I don't actually think that I do. Um, I, my natural tendency is to fall out of orbit. You know, I, I have a, an, an entropy built, built in that leads me towards selfishness and, and failure and hopelessness and will take me away from God. And it's really God himself who comes to us and continues to show us grace and mercy and forgiveness. And I think the only thing that I can really say over the time that I've been a Christian and been a Christian in leadership is that God doesn't give up on me. And God keeps coming to me when I let him down and keeps challenging me and picking me up and, and restoring, restoring me. Um, in, the, in the Barcelona Olympics, there's a really famous uh, moment in the men's 400 metres where Derek Redmond, who was one of the favourites to win a medal, pulls a hamstring and he can't go on. He's hobbling round the, round the top bend, determined to finish, tears streaming down his face. And this figure comes out of the crowd and puts his arm around him and the officials try and, and fend him off, but he gets alongside him and he, he helps Derek to get to the finish line. And it's his dad. His dad has come out of the crowd and come to his son in pain who is hobbling. He says, we'll finish this together. And it's a tremendous picture for me, really, of the, the grace and the mercy of God. He continues to, to come to me and to help me to keep going. And hopefully, um, in his grace and mercy, will help me to finish the race and ultimately win the prize. But that won't be because of my efforts or my cleverness. It'll be because of of God's grace and mercy, and also because of other people praying for me and encouraging me. Because um, there are some things in my life where I think, 
The only way I can explain why it's different today than it was yesterday is there must be people someplace praying for me. Mm -hmm. um, because I haven't done anything different. But things look different to me today in terms of uh, God's word and God's character and how I feel and where I'm, where I'm going. Because yeah. other people mediate grace to us, both in prayer and in relationship, and help us to, to, to keep going. I would say the beauty of community, um, certainly uh, over this past year, um, family-wise, my relationship with my husband because of illness and other things, it's been a very hard season, but just the prayers of the saints, people that love you well, people that check on you, people who let you know that they're caring for you and praying for you. I'd say uh, this is my seventh Urbana. The other thing that gives me hope are the students who are here and they're coming alive with faith, their passion, their creativity, uh, their love for God and the ways that that's expressed inspires me. There's times when I feel very, um, more lately, just what's happening in the world, what's happening in the country, and I feel discouraged or disheartened, and then I see this amazing generation of Christians that God is raising up, and I'm inspired by them and revitalized. So I'd say the students here are refreshing my hope about the future and the, the power of the kingdom of God. Well, and you know, one of the things that I hope all of you are watching at home, or maybe some of you are here in St. Louis or are catching, uh, tonight really, if you get anything out of tonight, it is that we focus on Jesus who sits on the throne. And I think I've been to a, a number of Urbanas and I keep forgetting and I want to put the focus on me. I want to put the focus on the world, the big problems we have in the world. I want to put the focus on so many other things, but really tonight was focusing on God. and. And even, I think, what you're saying. So I wonder for some of y'all who are watching us, um, if you're facing really big challenges in your life, um, some of the students and participants here at Urbana, the temptation to look at ourselves, the temptation to look at our circumstances, to look at our ministries, but really tonight was about focusing on Jesus, who sits on the throne. And so I think, I hope you would join us in really praying for the grace just to let focus be on God and so um, I just yeah I, I think I feel like <laughs> and, and, and encountering God in his word you yeah know, because God's yeah. word never gets tired never right. gets old it's always it's always there it's how God speaks to us yeah and, you know it's uh, you were talking about looking at a passage that you've read many times before yeah, yeah. and there being a, a breakthrough as you see it with fresh eyes as the Holy Spirit opens up that truth to you yeah and you know that I think one of the one of the things for, for people who are finding it tough is to, to open God's word yes. and yeah. ask that God would, would, would speak to them. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, and so I guess maybe as we kind of wrap things up, I um, want to thank you all for asking questions and, and we wish we had more time and we could, we could be here all night. Last night, we, we, you know, we, these are always gone longer. We schedule 15 minutes for these things and it just feels really hard to cut them off. Um, but um, I wonder if just the last thing is, is there, um, if you want to just give an encouragement to folks listening, or maybe something, um, I don't know. Just I, I just want to give you all a chance just to share anything on your heart with either participants here at Urbana or folks at home. I think I'm just kind of a mess right now from the whole day, so I'm just like, so many good things happened today, and so I wonder if there's just anything that the Lord has been putting on your heart that you might want to share. Uh, to... Sure. Um just been praying a lot for this particular uh, Urbana, and one of the images that came as uh, my husband and I were praying was just a sense of outpouring, that God was gonna pour out his spirit and that there was something unique about this Urbana. And as we got into our shuttle to come from the airport to here, our shuttle driver, Eric, said, oh, I'm so excited you're here. We've been traveling. Uh, I've been transporting people back and forth to this conference, and I'm praying that what's happening at Urbana will spill out and flow into the whole city of St. Louis. So we are praying for an outpouring that is not just here, not just St. Louis, but as people are uh, listening and participating from all over the world, that you will experience that outpouring. Yeah, I think I would say there is hope. And there is hope not because of what we find within ourselves, but because of the Lord Jesus and all that he has done for us and all that he will do for us because he is coming again. And the challenge for us is to use the days between that day and this day so that as many as possible are with us on that last great day 
singing God's praise for eternity from every tribe and every nation, that people hear the good news of Jesus, but that we remember that that good news is for us too, and that in the darkness there is light, when there is struggle there is hope, because God is working out his purposes, that the earth will be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea, and of the increase of his government there will be no end. The early Christians greeted each other with the word Maranatha, the Lord is coming. Mm -hmm. And they did it to encourage themselves in the midst of facing opposition and, and trouble. So wherever you are, whatever you're facing, there is hope. The Lord is coming. Even so, come Lord Jesus, come. Amen. I feel like we're, I, I mean, I feel like we need to sing a hymn now. I just kind of feel like. Uh, just, just, just reach out your hands. Yeah, push, yeah, push, yeah. Push the screen. Well, you know, uh, maybe we could just close in prayer. I feel like we could close in prayer. So I, I'm wondering, like, so if maybe if you're at home or, or at a hotel, um, you want to just join us. And I want to invite, so Nigel Pollock, President of University of Canada, Paul Fuller, Executive Vice President of University of USA, to kind of close our time. Uh, just to pray a blessing over us here in St. Louis. And then for all of you at home, uh, we don't know all of your stories, but that God would minister to you and, and you would hear God's voice uh, this week. Um, and tomorrow morning, we're going to be back here at 1045 a.m. Central Time. Um, so please join us. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, bookmarkurbana.org, and, and share with us, maybe through Instagram or Twitter or YouTube comments, what God is doing in your life. Um, and so I guess maybe have Paula and then I just want to pray a blessing over all of us and pray for our time. Lord, it is so good to be in your presence and to be in your presence together. We thank you for everyone who has called to join in, who is watching to connect with us and the powerful work you're doing, not only here in Urbana, St. Louis, but all over the world. And we just pray your blessing for everyone who is connecting with us tonight and even for those who will watch this message at a future time, that they will um, experience the fullness, the breadth and the length, the depth uh, the height of your love, Lord, that surpasses knowledge and that they will come to know you, that they will walk in even deeper relationship with you and that your glory, and your <coughs> holiness uh, would be made manifest, uh, that we would experience you and that we would reflect your glory in the world. Amen. Thank you, Lord, that you know each person who is here this week, that you know each person who is connecting with this around the world and that you know us all intimately and love us all unconditionally. And I pray that you might help us to, to grow in that love and appreciate more the depth of the love that you have for us and all that you have done for us in sending the Lord Jesus to die on the cross, to rise again, seated now at the Father's right hand, waiting to come in the future to usher in a glorious new age that will last forever. And we do want to pray that you might help us to look to Jesus, to see people as you see them, and that we might have the love that you uh, show to them in our hearts, which we know can only come from you. And pray for those of us who are perhaps struggling with darkness or with confusion or with difficulty, to know that there is hope and that that grace which you have for others is also extended to us. So pray that you might um, bless us and that you might remind us of the great truths of the gospel and that in particular you might remind us of the Lord Jesus and that you might help us to see ourselves and to see the world and to see others through that kingdom lens that we've been talking about tonight. In his name, amen. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Bye. Missing you.